Hello, everybody. Good evening. Nice that I can be here. On my way here, I had some problems with the Deutsche Bahn. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there was a bushfire along the track in Buchholz, not far from here. And so the train couldn't go on because the fire brigade had to come to extinguish the bushfire. Now, climate change is here, guys, really. I mean, it's June and we have more bushfires than ever in Germany. Yeah. Okay, what I will talk about is not climate change tonight, but is circular design, and that's, that was my assignment. And I said uh, my title could be circular design, the devil is in the details, or to phrase it a little bit more polite, um, the difficulty is in the details, or the details really matter. And that's actually what also Almut said just right now. There are many, many different strategies and many trade-offs, and when do you know what is the right strategy and which one to use, uh, at what product you're working on, and so on and so on. So it's not so simple to say, hey, now we make, we use recycled materials, we make everything recyclable, and now we have circular design and circular economy. No, unfortunately, it's not that simple. Okay, here we go. How can I click? Just uh, click. Okay, it's almost seven. I will try to be a little shorter than half an hour, and I will talk about circular design. And now I use the button. Yes. Okay, we have a war in Europe, we all know that, and the war is not just a very terrible, stupid, bad thing, but it's also about resources. Now we say, okay, there's this bad Putin, and Putin sends us gas and oil, and we should not use the gas and oil from Putin anymore, not to give him money to continue with the war. That's a very good idea, and we should have run, uh, we should have phased out the non-renewable energy sources already 16 years ago, if you ask me, but yeah, now we're trying to do it. Okay, but then what are we doing? We're going for maybe nuclear power again? No, too dangerous. Are we going to go back to coal? No, because that is climate change. So what we need is renewable energy, right? Renewable energy is a good thing. It comes from wind, from sun, from water. But to harvest the energy of the sun, what do we need? Solar panels. And solar panels have silicium and other precious metals. And there's a lot of copper that has to go in the batteries that we need to, space, to, spare, to, to save all this renewable energy. And what do we need for that? We need resources. And where do these resources come from? China, South America, Chile. So now we have a new dependency on countries where we might not want to be depending on. Okay, and besides of this geopolitical dimension, we also are just simply running out of some of our resources. And this graphic is really beautiful because it shows you what kind of resources uh, we have and we use and how long they still last, how many years. And they are really resources like indium, like iridium, where we almost have nothing left and we're still using them. They are in our smartphones, in our digital uh, electronic products, and so on and so on. So what are we going to do if they are gone? Well, we have to search for substitutes, but for how long do we still have these substitutes? Because they are very precious, very rare metals and minerals, and so on and so on. Well, there is a problem. I think the solution is, indeed, thinking circular, because our future resources might be in the stuff that we already have, like in the buildings that we have built, like in the mountains of waste that are out there that we have just like covered with soil, but they're still there, all of these metals and plastics and whatever. And yes, there's also mountains of um, waste, like plastic in the ocean, which we don't really see, but they're there on the ground. And so we will have to dig deep and go back to these resources that we already used to get our future resources. And the other very important thing is the efficiency and effectiveness, obviously. So we cannot continue to consume and even consume more like we do today. It's simply not possible. We Germans, we had our Earth Overshoot Day. Do you know? When was it? Earth Overshoot Day? 
5th of May, I think. Do you know what the Earth Overshoot Day is? Yes? So it's the day when we have actually consumed all of our resources that the Earth can renew within one year. 5th of May, gone. From then on, we live consuming the planet in Germany. Other countries are even worse. Other countries are much, 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 much better than we. Okay, and then there's also a business case because by now, producing companies pay more money for resources, for materials that they use and the services to get these materials into their factories than they pay for people. So it makes much more sense to make resources more efficient, to use them more efficiently, make resources unemployed than to sack your people. But still consultants go in the, in the companies and tell them, okay, we need to increase human resource efficiency and things like that. Okay, and so um, to conclude, we need to look at our resources. We need to figure out how we can make them more uh, lasting longer for us. We need to maybe look into more renewable resources and less non-renewable, but we have a lot of other issues when it comes to sustainability that are somehow all connected. So for instance, the circular economy, can it also do something for climate change? Can it also do something to reduce the um, diminishing of biodiversity? Can it do something to reduce social uh, aspects to, uh, to improve uh, um, our non-dependency on uh, countries that we don't want to do business with, reduce wars and conflicts and things like that. So it's a very complex world out there, many sustainability issues, and we need to figure out what can we do to solve some of these issues, but somehow they all are interconnected. I think Almut has already explained what circular economy is, so I don't really need to do it. We need to go from the linear economy that we have now, take, make, waste, <laughs> to the circular economy where everything is actually cycled and on the highest level possible uh, so that we can do that for a very, very long time without running out of resources and without ruining our environment. And then there's the Ellen MacArthur Foundation with the so-called butterfly diagram, I think we all know it, and it explains how this kind of circular economy could work. And um, I think it's nothing really new because there are many, many people who have talked and thought about circular economy already in the 80s and in the 90s. When I started, 1992, we have developed eco-design and eco-design includes circular design right from the beginning on and we have talked about that and wrote about that for many, many years. Like Walter Stahel in the 1980s developed strategies how to extend product life and Re reusing, repairing, all this uh, extension of product life strategies were part of that. Uh, and then, you know, McDonald Brown got uh, the MBDC, for sure the cradle to cradle concept that was in the 1990s. Uh, that's the principle of the cradle to cradle. You have a technical cycle and a biological cycle. You should not use any toxic substances and you use 100% renewable energy and make everything on the highest level circular. And Germany has a circular economy law already from 1994. Who knows that? Very good. Most people don't. So we have already started to think about circular economy many, many years ago. Unfortunately, that was thinking from recycling from the end. So we have waste. Now let's try to do something with the waste, get it back, recycle it. But of course, we need to rethink uh, the circular economy from the beginning and not from the end. And then comes the European Commission with the circular economy action plan and that's what we have just talked about. So why do we design or not do it? It's out there for 30 years, why don't we do, not do it? I mean, you have to ask that yourself. Um, circular product design would mean to design a product strategically to anticipate its life cycle, its lifetime, and to design it so that every bit of the material that I put into the product can be reused, remanufactured, or recycled. That would be a good circular product design. But it's not enough, because what we also need to do is we need to design the system around the product. A product that's circular doesn't really do anything good if the system that it's used in 
can also be cyclic, can recycle it, reuse it, remanufacture it. So what we actually need is circular system design, and also we designers could do a good job here, and that is based on cooperation, because the different value chains would actually exchange materials and components and products in between so that at the end we get something that we call an industrial ecology system. That is a system which is probably based on digitalization and digital product passports, as we have just heard Almut explain them. And this system is systematically designed in a way that we know exactly where our materials are, what product it uses it at the moment, when this product will be ready for being reused, and to then include these materials, components, and so on in another value chain. And that goes automatically digitalized. And I had understood that the Fab City or you guys try to do something in that uh, direction, which I think is really good. And it's not utopia. These things exist. What I just showed you was the Kalundborg industrial ecology system that exists already since the 1990s. Uh, but also now there are more and more industries that say, hey, we want to set up these kind of systems. So for instance, textile industry, there's the um, Fair Wear to Wear Foundation, and the Wear to Wear Foundation actually, as a, its aim is to set up a circular textile system, and what they do is they connect all companies along the life cycle of the textiles, and um, from the production of yarns to the fabrics, oops, to the production of the products, to the collection and the, the re recycling, sorting, uh, washing and so on. And so that this circle can actually go on and go on and go on without using a lot of uh, virgin materials and without creating a lot of waste. So that's their ambition. Um, they are not that far yet, but they want to set up a system like that. And so if we want to do the circular design, we have strategies, of course. And um, I sh I'm sure you all know the R's, the rethink, redesign, reduce, reuse, repair, remanufacture, recycle, and so on. Uh, and we just need to include that into our design strategies for products, right? But then there are also the D's, and many people don't, are not aware that besides of this, uh, on the material level, this reusing and repairing and man remanufacturing, we also need to do on a, on a molecule level. We need to de-alloy the metals. We need to depolymerize the plastics. We need to de-vulcanize the rubbers and so on and so on. Why are you guys laughing? Do you know this image? Okay, later. <laughs> okay. And we need to deconstruct high-rise buildings and major infrastructure and so on. And so, so all of these activities that we need to plan when we do design, right? And we need to plan to use already used materials. We need to plan to use already used components and so on and so on. That needs to be like the DNA of our designs to take old stuff and by design make it into new and valuable products. That's our job as designers. So what are design principles? First of all, we still want long FET, so we still need to design for attachment and trust because things that we love, we try to use for a very long time and we try to keep well and take care of. So uh, that's the first thing that we should do. Then we need to design for durability because extending the product life makes a lot of sense. I will show a slide uh, regarding to that a little bit later. Then we need to design for standardization and compatibility. Why? Because when we want to exchange components from old products to new products or, the, or in between different types of products, then of course they need to be standardized and these products need to be modular. So it needs to be compatible. Then we need to design for maintenance and repair. If you want the people to have the right to repair their products, of course we need to design them so that they can be repaired and they need to be um, maybe even do-it-yourself kits uh, so that people can repair it themselves and so on. 
We also need to design for adaptability and upgradability because then we can, for instance, technical progress, products that have some kind of technical progress where the next uh, generation is more efficient than the current generation can be upgraded technically and uh, can be more efficient and so on. And finally, of course, we need to design for disassembly and reassembly, disassemble different types of materials so that they can uh, be recycled and reused. Okay, now I have a question to you. This circular design sounds really good. Do you think it is sustainable? Do you think we can just keep doing what we're doing if we just make everything circular? If we would do a good job in doing that? What do you think? Who thinks yes? Two? Who thinks no? Okay, the majority. Why do you think no? Well, Almud already said it also, kind of. And anyone who wants to say something about no, why not? Okay, let's look at it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just briefly, yeah. entropy. Very good. We do not have um, an infinite machine that runs on nothing. You know, no matter how many times, optimization is a good goal. You're my man. <laughs> okay, let's look at it. Well, at the moment, or generally, the substitution rates are very low. So in plastics, for instance, we use millions of tons of plastic. And then we do recycle a little bit of it. But that recycled material does not substitute virgin plastics. It's used in some other context. It does not really avoid that new plastic is needed and produced. Um, the mountains of waste are still growing. We don't have the collection systems and the remanufacturing recycling technologies yet. And the social aspects are totally ignored. Who is going to disassemble, disassemble all the products? Who is going to clean all this old material and so on and so on? And we have still the overconsumption going on. That's why we need also sufficiency, like Almud also said. Recycling cannot um, feed the demand as it is increasing at the moment. Demand is still increasing. So here is the example of copper. Even if we do recycle all the copper that we have, the demand is increasing in a way that is so fast that we will not never, it will never be enough to recycle the copper if we are going to increase the demand as we do today. And then finally, your argument, the second law of thermodynamics and entropy tells us every transformation process needs energy. We need to transport, we need to disassemble, we need to sort, we need to wash, and so on and so on. We need to reform. And all these processes need energy and um, our effort. And we don't have all the energy at the moment from renewable sources. So the more energy we use for the transformation processes, we still are going to increase climate change, which we shouldn't do, right? So we have to figure out what are really good, efficient, reuse, recycling, and so on systems, and what is something that we should probably not do because it makes no sense. And finally, the accumulation of toxic substances and dissipation are two issues. So if I, if I do reuse and recycle everything, but there are toxic substances inside because it's maybe old plastics, where we didn't really know what we are putting in, then it will accumulate again and again and again. So there are three minutes? Oh, really? Is it true? <laughs> nee, 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 ich habe um sieben angefangen. Ich rede gerade 13 Minuten. Ja? We will see. <laughs> I was promised half an hour. Okay. So this whole toxic substances accumulate and then there's dissipation. It means tire wear, microplastics in the ocean, um, and so on and so on. Things that distribute in the environment. We will never get that stuff back. So it will be hard to recycle that. All right, so to conclude this part, Sustainable economy also needs efficiency, consistency, sufficiency. So sufficiency means less is more. We really need to think what we need to have a good life and maybe use less. 
uh, consistency means yes, it should be digestible for the nature, so we should be able to set, cycle everything in nature, uh, cradle to cradle, and efficiency means yes, try to make the most out of the least amount of resources that we use, so increase efficiency. If you just take that with you home, these three things, impl implement them in your design, then you are actually really good guys. And we have many tools that we use to implement that in design. For instance, we designed the sustainability design matrix where we have um, the life cycle stages and these different sustainability issues. And we, in all of our product design that we do and the consulting that we do, we try to figure out what are the most important strategies for this specific product. Uh, we look at biodiversity, resource efficiency, energy efficiency, improved usefulness, circular economy, social and health issues. And all of that should be covered. Of course, sometimes some aspects are more important than others, so you can't do everything all the time. A couple of examples. I have a case study for a biological cycle. Fast food has a lot of waste in terms of packaging. Uh, and one of my students said, hey, why can't we do fast food packaging like we do ice cones? You know, I, at, I eat my ice cone, so no packaging at all. Can we do something like that for fast food? Biological cycle goes back to nature or can be fed to animals or composted. Technical cycle, um, one of my clients is the ESA group. Uh, they're designing waste bins. And these waste bins, meanwhile, are 100% closed loop circular. That means the company takes back every bin. They have a little uh, truck that goes around and uh, picks the broken bins and the uh, material is shredded in the truck and can go back to production. Of course, they had to redesign the bins a little bit that the system makes more sense, but now they're really perfect in doing that. And urban mining upcycling projects, uh, like some of my students from Zurich, they did, um, we did a re, um, recycling, upcycling project, and they used old supermarket shelves, old mattresses, and army blankets from the Swiss army. That's why this product is called the Swiss officer. And so they, they designed a furniture line using really old materials. What we also need to look into is uh, new materials generally that, that are cir circular, that might be coming from waste sources, they might be recyclable and they might go back to nature because they are non-toxic. Like for instance, this liquid wood, Arboform, it's made from waste from the paper industry or the wood industry and it works like thermoplastic so we can injection mold, vacuum form and so on with it. And then at the end you can still recycle it or it can also go back to nature. So very super circular material. If I had time, I would talk with you about biomaterials, <laughs> but I think I will skip this slide because it's... Um, maybe we can have a discussion in one of the workshops tomorrow. Then what we also need is new dismantling and recycling technologies. And here I show the example of Apple, which is high-tech recycling robot that can take, uh, disassemble the smartphones. And Apple has a plan in the future not to use any virgin materials anymore, but to feed their production from the reused stuff, which is really ambitious. But it doesn't need to be high-tech, it can also be low-tech. We need to figure out how people manually can disassemble stuff and it should not be a very bad uh, activity to do so. We need to do design our products that it's maybe easy to disassemble and reuse. We also, and that's something for the Fab Lab, I think you guys probably do that already. Um, we can use used plastics and make filament from it and then 3D print with that material. Uh, and uh, companies like Porsche or Canon already do that. So they take their used plastics and they uh, print, for instance, spare parts or smaller numbers of new parts. I skip that. And all of that must be based on renewable energy. And I think we uh, are really aware that this energy issue is a big uh, key, a big lever to get the circular economy more sustainable. Because if you make it circular by using coal and oil and gas, it will probably not be very sustainable. Okay, my last point to you is not just products, it's business models, and that's also what Almut already said. Because maybe we can even eliminate products altogether. 
Maybe we can get away from using materials. Maybe we can invent new ways of doing things. And I just show you this example. The key is going away from selling products to selling services, functions, or results. And if we do so, the company who does that has the motivation to use the products very, very long and intensively because they don't earn money by selling a product, but they earn money by offering functions. And that is our example here that we have designed in a research project. It's a little mobile office. You can use it, especially now for the um, pandemic time where we all were sitting at home, but sometimes we still wanted to use an office. We have designed this mobile um, office here. It's totally autark, creates its own energy and uh, collects rainwater for the little uh, toilet inside. And it, uh, you, you can just rent it for the time that you want. Just pay for the minutes that you used it, and then the next person can actually use it. So it's a product service system to fulfill the need of having a, an office from time to time. And now just imagine how many big buildings we could save, big offices, if we all would use these kind of small rental offices. Okay, so the message is from incremental improvement making my product a little bit more circular and efficient, to really leapfrogging to a new idea of a business that maybe don't even sells products, produces products, but maybe sells services, sells functions, sells results, and so on. There are many examples out there, and I think we designers should also uh, try to adapt that thinking really radically rethinking the system that the company uses at the moment, and maybe I can suggest something else which does not even need a new product. Okay, conclusion. Important details of circular design, from my point of view, are not automatically everything that I do circular is sustainable. I need to evaluate properly, and there are tools for that, if my circular strategy really is more sustainable than the current state of the art. I need to look into details and evaluate. Otherwise, I cannot really know if I'm going into the right direction. Circular design needs to be thought from the beginning, from the idea of what do I want to put on the market and what do I want to, um, you know, what kind of product I want to design, and not from the end, oops, I have some waste, uh, now I need to recycle. So think from, rethink and not think in terms of recycling, uh, recycling. And then if you want to go for circular, I think it needs a critical analysis first. Does it make sense? What kind of strategy makes sense? I need to look into if my new circular design idea indeed saves energy, indeed saves materials, or maybe it's even more effort than I do. At the end. Then if I decide that it's really a good idea, you should consider which system you want to use. Is it going into the bio biological cycle? Is it going to the technical cycle? Do I have, can I design a new business model? Uh, so where do I want to go uh, with that specific assignment that I have on my table? And finally, um, if I decide it's, it's a good idea and I know which kind of direction I want to go, of course, then I need to redesign my products, but also the service that is created around the product. And then I think you really did a good job. There are books that you can read that explain more in detail what I have just told you especially the what is eco-design or how to do eco-design. You can download them for free online. I can also share the presentation that you can have the links, so read further. You can also study. Uh, oh, oh, there's the Circular Economy Initiative Germany. I don't know if you know it. I was a member of that initiative and they have also created some really nice publications about business models and strategies for circular um, economy. So also that is downloadable for free online. And last bit, um, I am just the new professor for sustainable design at the Wilhelm Büchner Hochschule and we have created a new bachelor program that is called sustainable design. So if you want to study this, um, go to the website of the Wilhelm Büchner Hochschule and maybe get informed and maybe you can come and study with me what I have just explained to you. Thank you very much.